So, can a Christian become morally holy? If those who teach and preach continue to tell others they can't, then what hope is there? The real answer is, of course we can. God calls us to be holy as he is holy. Why would God tell us that, then set us up to fail? There are few in the body of Christ that believe in the doctrine of entire sanctification, and yet it was the foundational doctrine of the Methodists, of Quakers, Anabaptists, the Salvation Army, and the Pentecostals. Pentecostalism grew directly out of the holiness movement, and yet the Pentecostals are the ones that I hear denying moral holiness more than any other group. Oh, how I wish I had a dollar for every Pentecostal. I heard say that we will never be perfect. We will always sin until the day we die. We will always be morally faulty. Now, where does it say that in the Bible? Because if that is the truth, then why try? And this is my point. When you teach that, then it turns people away from seeking the fullness of the kingdom. Um, but this is what happens when the founding fathers of a movement pass away and a new breed of leaders take over and they start distorting the original vision. Jesus was righteous. He was holy and blameless before God. But the Bible says so was Job and Noah and Abraham, Lot, King David, King Asa, King Hezekiah, Enoch, King Josiah, Abel, Zechariah, Moses, Mary the mother of Jesus and Joseph, her husband, Joseph of Arimathea, Cornelius, John the Baptist, Simeon, the Apostle Paul, Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, and so will the 144,000 be. And yet, Christians keep finding excuses and creating doctrines in order to not make that journey and then turn around and teach others so. I don't want to be rude, but my channel is not for the nominal Christian. It never has been. It's not for the lukewarm. It's not for that kind of Christian. It's not for those who are playing the religious game. It's for the faithful it's for those who have no plan B. It's only for those who have gambled their life on plan A, those that have spent their life on God, whilst others did pretty much whatever they wanted. I'm hoping to do a video on, on faith soon, what true faith is, and not what we are being sold as faith. It's the faithful that God is looking for to call into this final day's army. And holiness is a prerequisite of that. The call to moral holiness is going out across the earth from those who are hearing that from the Holy Spirit to those who will respond. This is not the time to delay. This is not the time for games. God is already exposing the sins in his people. You know, um, I've, I've seen a shift happen as we came into this year. Uh, people that I used to trust, every word that came out of their mouth, are suddenly showing a dark side to themselves. Darkness that was hidden in them, that, that comes from false thinking, false doctrines, um, all of a sudden is starting to come to the surface, is being exposed. Now, this should humble us because what God is, is doing, you know, he's amping it up this year. Uh, and God always starts with the leaders, but he finishes with the little ones, those of us at the end of the line, or as I shared, I think it was yesterday in Rose's vision, you know, those of us at the bottom of the ladder. Moral purity is not imputed righteousness but it's being sold to us as that. Now, there are two types of holiness, justification and sanctification, but they're not the same thing. Justification is not moral righteousness. The extreme of this teaching is hyper-grace, but there are plenty that are misguided in their understanding of this 
and are teaching a subtle hyper grace um, that by faith we are made righteous and um, they are connecting this to moral holiness. And uh, whether they teach these things by substitute, subterfuge or whether they're being blatant, whether it be by ignorance or by deceit, it's potency to steer people away from the belief that we can come to a place of moral purity in this life is wicked. It's working in tandem with the enemy to strip you of the fullness of the kingdom. And it's a very clever ploy of the enemy to block those who are called to be the 144,000 and to keep them from their destiny. This is why we need to be educated because there is so much deception out there um, and it's getting very difficult to discern truth because it's so cleverly um, mixed with um, cunningly mixed with truth. Um, this is one of the reasons God is exposing this stuff in Christianity right now so that it will set free those who are caught by it, so it will set them free to make their own decisions, to find, to look for the truth. I'm going to give you as much information on this as I can. Then, you know, you make up your own mind. The idea is for me to, to give you whatever it is that you don't have and add to whatever it is you do have. You know, every no one has the full knowledge of everything, you know, so we can garner the good stuff, you know, we learn to separate the precious from the vile and then we make educated decisions. People perish for the lack of knowledge. But we must stop selling imputed righteousness as the end game when all that does is actually open the door for the process to begin. So we're going to start by looking at the three stages of salvation and then we'll look at the pattern of this scene in the tabernacle because God has put this pattern in the tabernacle and in the temple. Once we see this in the tabernacle, it becomes a little harder to reject it. Now, there will be um, there there will be more information about this in the book that I'm writing, which is slow developing, but it's it's there. Um, but I've been making videos on all the chapters from the book anyway, so I'm I'm giving um, information about it. Anyway, so the book will come, but the information is on my channel anyway. So there are three stages to salvation. Now, each stage gives us access into one of the three areas of the tabernacle or temple. So the three stages are justification, sanctification and glorification. The first stage is justification, also known as imputed righteousness. This is what happens at the point of conversion when God declares us righteous by faith. It is made possible by what Christ did on the cross for us. Now, God does this for two main reasons. In order to make us acceptable in his sight and in doing so, being able to then remove our debt to sin, which is death. So at the point of conversion, God gives us the free gift of immortality, known biblically as eternal life, uh, which could not happen if we still owed the law its penalty, which is death. So God removes death from us as a free gift for our decision to turn to him. This is what is meant by we are saved by grace and not by works. This is justification. We do nothing to earn or deserve this. Now that's all we're promised at the point of conversion. What justification does is remove our debt to sin. It removes death from us. That's all. What justification does not do is remove sin from us. 
It only removes the penalty of sin. What the hyper-grace doctrine does, and all those that preach that imputed righteousness is the highest level of purity, is to hang all their ideology on justification. They stop at this point. They never move forward. The second stage of salvation is sanctification. Now, where justification removes our debt to sin, sanctification is the process of having sin removed from us. So justification is an external work of God. It does nothing to the heart. Sanctification is an internal work where the Holy Spirit writes God's laws on our hearts and minds. Our heart and spirit is healed and cleansed from the defilement of sin. It is the process of being transformed into the image of Christ. It is the process of overcoming the flesh and having the fruit of the spirit develop in our lives. Justification does not do that. This sanctification is the wilderness. What Bible hero didn't have their wilderness prior to them serving in the calling that God gave them? Now, the third stage of salvation is glorification. This is what happened to Jesus after his resurrection. He was raised in a glorified body. This is reserved for the bride. When the Bible refers uh, to the white garment, the bride's garment, this is what has been spoken of. So let's now look at how this fits into the pattern in the tabernacle and the temple. I'll, I'll include a graph at, at the end of the video um, for you to look at um, to help make it easier to understand what I'm saying here. So first up is justification or imputed righteousness. Justification is represented in the temple by the outer court. To enter the outer court, people had to pass through the east gate. Now, when Adam and Eve rebelled, they were cast out of Eden to the east. When Cain sinned, he was cast out of Eden to the east. The more we rebel against God, the further the distance comes becomes between us and God's holy presence, which resided in the Holy of Holies, right? So the Bible describes our being cast away from God's presence as moving towards the east. The further east you go, the further you are in rebellion and the further away from God's presence. The Bible speaks of God's presence as a relationship. It's seen as a gift, as a reward. Um, to be allowed in the presence of God is to be blessed indeed. Now, to repent starts the process of coming back to him. It means to return to him, to turn from walking away from him in our rebellion and to start to walk back uh, to God through repentance and obedience. God's presence, as I said, resided in the holiest of holies in the temple. To get back to God is to work our way back to the holiest of holies. It is to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. God gives us the pattern in the temple. We enter the tabernacle or temple through the east gate. The way into the east gate is through our conversion or justification. Our conversion gives us access into the outer court, but only into the outer court. Now, in the temple, anyone was allowed into the outer court. Even Gentiles were allowed to enter the east gate. Even women were allowed to enter the east gate. Now, the priests that served in the outer court were not required to be holy, nor were they required to be of the bloodline of Aaron. They handled dead things continually. They were always defiled. Now, there's a sila. They were the common priesthood. The outer court represents the first level of the kingdom. Anyone can come. 
All you need is a conversion experience. All you need to do is believe on the name of Jesus and that his sacrifice was a propitiation for our sins and the penalty of death will be removed from you. That's what took place in the outer court, right? Sacrifices were made for sin and the death penalty was removed. That was the place for the sacrifices for sin in the outer court. This is the level of the common Christian, the lukewarm, the hypergrace, and all those that accept imputed righteousness as the highest level of their walk with God. They stay in the outer court. Now let's look at sanctification in the tabernacle pattern. The priesthood that served God in the holy place had to be holy. They had to be consecrated. That meant they were separated from the world and set apart for his use in the kingdom. The priests could not enter the holy place in the temple until they had been consecrated and sanctified before God. Before they could enter the holy place, they had to pass through the waters of the brass laver, which stood in front of the veil that that you pass through to enter the Holy of Holies. I've done a video um, previously on water baptism. You may want to refer back to that video to understand a more, um, more fully that of consecration. Um, after the labour, the priesthood then entered the holy place by passing through the first veil. The doorway into the holy place was a veil and it was made of white, blue, scarlet and purple threads. Those four colours speak of Jesus. It speaks of his righteousness, his heavenly nature, his sacrifice and his kingship. The only way to enter through the first veil is through Jesus. He's the door. Um, passing through this veil gives us access into God's presence and to his grace. Access to the holy place is also from the east. Jesus told us to enter the kingdom of, if we are to enter the kingdom of God, we must be born again first of water and the spirit. The only way to pass through the door into the holy place is through water baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? This is what makes the church. The priests went through a strict cleansing process before they were allowed to serve beyond the first veil. They were first cleansed with water and then had oil poured over their head and down their priestly garments, and those things speak of consecration and the Holy Spirit. Now, um, let's look at the holy place itself. Um, when Jesus ascended, he left the church with three very specific gifts to assist her to victory and to bring her through the second veil, not the first veil, but to bring her through the second veil and into the holiest of holy where God's glory resides. He left the church three gifts to help his bride reach glorification. He gave the church the Holy Spirit, the Lord's Supper, and the cross. In the holy place where the holy priesthood served, we find the lampstand, which represents the Holy Spirit, the table of showbread that represents the Lord's Supper, and the altar of incense that represents the cross. The holy place represents the age of the church. It's also interesting to know that the cubic area of the holy place is 2,000 square cubits, the same amount of years as the church age. Those Christians who live in the outer court believe that they will be automatically glorified. They believe that we are all the bride. It suits them to think that because then there's no personal responsibility and they don't have to suffer to enter the kingdom. Beyond the second veil is the Holy of Holies where God's glory resides. 
Only the holy priest could enter the Holy of Holies and then only once a year after a very stringent cleansing and anointing ceremony that involved not just the high priest, he wasn't just the one who went through a cleansing um, ceremony, but all of Israel also went through. Um, access to the Holy of Holies was also from the east. So passing through this veil gives us access not just to God's presence but to his glory. It gives us access to the tree of life. It is the glory of God upon our lives that makes us the light of the world. If we are to be witnesses of God's glory, if it is to rest on our lives, then we have to have access to the Holy of Holies. And we have to develop an unbroken fellowship with God in that place. We can't be going in and out all the time. Now, to remain in unbroken fellowship in that place requires moral holiness. We must be cleansed of all defilement in order to penetrate the second veil because no flesh can enter in. All flesh is defiled and must be left outside the veil it is only our spirit that enters the holiest of heavenly realms and only after our spirit has been totally cleansed of all unrighteousness this means a total death to all idolatry and sexual immorality only the bride is permitted to pass through the second veil and into full unbroken relationship and have access to the tree of life because she has made herself ready. The white garment that she now wears is a symbol of the garment worn by the high priest, which allowed him to enter the holiest of holies. This garment represents the righteous acts or the holiness of the saints. Access into the holy of holy gives us access directly into God's realm. It also speaks of... Um, being restored back to that same place that Adam and Eve was at in the garden before their rebellion. So let's look at the second veil now. From Genesis chapter 3, it says this, So he drove out the man and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. When Adam and Eve were removed from the garden, cherubim were placed at the entrance to the garden to prevent those defiled from entering back into the garden and corrupting it. In Numbers chapter 18, we see God giving instruction to Aaron, the high priest, that he was to assemble priests from his tribe that would guard the sanctuary from defiled persons. If an unclean person entered the sanctuary or came near its altar and defiled it, that person would die. That's in Numbers um, 18 verses 1 to 7. Um, now in Revelations 21 it says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. But there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles or causes abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gate. God protects his holy places, right? He protects them. No flesh, nothing defiled can come in and corrupt God's holy places. So God set cherubim at the entrance of the Garden of Eden because the tree of life was there. The glory of God is life. God's glory resided in the holy place in the temple sanctuary. In front of the holy place hangs a thick tapestry. On that tapestry are embroidered two cherubim. Now the cherubim, that they represent the no-go zone of God. As we know, only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement, only after a rigorous cleansing ceremony of everybody. If anyone else was to enter that place, they would die. 
God had has also sent angels at the 12 gates into, into New Jerusalem so that no one that is defiled may enter there. The New Jerusalem is where the glory of the Father and the Son reside. It is where the tree of life is. The angels guard the gates, not to keep out the unsaved. The unsaved will be judged before this time. These angels keep out those that have received the free gift of eternal life but rejected the reconciling and redeeming work of the Holy Spirit, those in the outer court. For the defiled Christian, for those that live rather to satisfy the lusts of their flesh, their destiny is out of darkness. They will not be permitted to enter the holy presence and glory of God and corrupt it. Jesus promised he would vomit the lukewarm out of his mouth. This is the same judgment that God gave to Israel concerning the promised land, that if they accept the covenant with him but did not keep his laws and walk holy before him, then the land would vomit them out. After the crucifixion of Christ, he passed through the temple veil, tearing it asunder as he went through. He was able to do this because his flesh had been fully crucified on the cross. He did this also for us as well to provide a way so that we would also have access to God. But, and there is a very big but, Access is not automatic, as some will tell you. Before the veil that has the two cherubim embroidered on it that are stopping us from entering into the alt, uh, into the holiest of hol holies stands the altar of incense. It represents the cross. It is the place where we offer up our lives as living sacrifices. The holy priest, before he entered the holiest of holies on the Day of Atonement, sprinkled the blood from the sacrifice of, of the bullock and the goat and then placed incense on the altar. Now the all incense would float into the holiest of holies, taking with it um, the evidence that there had been death. A death had taken place in substitution for sin. Then the holy priest could enter. Our flesh has to be offered up as a sacrifice on the altar before we too can enter into the glory of God. Nothing defiled can enter. If you are defiled, you cannot enter the holiest of holies. To be defiled, as we have looked at in previous videos, is to be still walking after our fleshly lust and not after the spirit. That you, we have to come to a place where we are fully, fully walking after the spirit. Our flesh must be fully called to death before God will let us pass through the second veil. No flesh can enter the holy of holies. Now this speaks a full restoration back to the state of when Adam and Eve walked with God in full unbroken fellowship uh, in the garden, as I've said. Plenty of people prophesy from that place between the veils. They prophesy from the holy place. That's not the holiest of holies. When people prophesy from between the veils, from, from the holy place, it's mixed with flesh. Those who are prophesying from beyond the second veil, it's not mixed with flesh. It's pure, unadulterated revelation and word coming from the throne room of God. And there is a people coming at the end of this age that will walk in that glory of God. Those who are wise shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Holiness is all about the wilderness. It is about bringing our flesh fully to death on the cross. We offer up our lives as living sacrifices. That's what faith is. It's not about imputed righteousness. 
You cannot become holy by declaring it by faith. You must work out with the Holy Spirit and take the kingdom of God by force in your life. It is a battle that must be overcome and only the overcomers will be given the kingdom as Jesus makes clear in his message to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. You don't get this because you said the sinner's prayer. You don't get this because you think you're entitled to it. It's a faith journey one that requires great faith, but faith that requires works. As it says, faith without works is dead. So I hope this is all making holiness a little clearer for you. Um, I have more to share with you about the pattern that we see in the temple. Um, we'll just wait and see where God leads us. So bless you. If there is anyone out there who hasn't received Jesus, um, you haven't made Jesus your Lord and Saviour, you know, now is the time. The Bible says today is a day of salvation. You know, you can't wait any longer. You could die tomorrow. You could die tonight. There could be at any point in time where you are no longer here and you've left it too late. Now is the time to receive Jesus. And right now I'm going to lead you into prayer. And all you have to do is, is pray after me. Um, and just receive Jesus because you don't know what could happen tomorrow. But let him renew your mind. Let him renew your heart and change you and make you a new creation in him. So I'm just going to pray with you now. And you're, you're free to um, repeat after me and anybody else who um, who has already received Jesus. Um, just pray this, please, as well. And just pray for the people who are to receive Jesus right now. So repeat after me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Saviour, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I believe that you can wash me clean with your precious blood. I repent of my sin. I confess that I am a sinner in need of a saviour. And I receive you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you've just prayed that prayer, then you've received Jesus. And I say congratulations to you it's the best decision you can ever make um and the bible says that if one person gets saved there is a whole army of angels in heaven rejoicing so you know they are all rejoicing even just when one person gets saved so if you've received jesus now and you've said that prayer honestly rest assured that there are angels in heaven you know rejoicing and, and just so glad right now and celebrating for you um God bless you all and I just pray that you will have peace in these last days and strength and endurance and boldness um, and yeah I just, just pray that you'll be well. God bless you all. Mm -hmm.